Pete's book. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the hack culture. Um, and I hope to get plenty of questions from you guys. Um, so briefly, I've been at F Facebook for two years. I'm also the site lead for the London office, which we just opened. So it's really great for me to be here, um, coming over here to chat with you guys. So first, I'd like to start with um, 6,200 as a number. So can anybody guess what this represents? Probably can't. 6,200 is the average number of lines of code that professional engineers write in a year. So if you hear that, that should be really depressing. Because if you've been here for the last few days and participated in any of the hacks, you have probably personally exceeded this line count just in the last three or four days. If my talk is bad enough, you will probably do several hundred lines by the end of this talk. And so when I say the typical person writes 6,200 lines a year professionally, it's just really depressing. Um, let's talk about how people spend their time. I have a display here that represents 15% design time, 20%, 25% coding time, 60% bug stabilization time. These are the times that in Microsoft Office and Microsoft Windows, an engineer spends throughout a two or three year release cycle. So 25% of an engineer's time, typically professionally, is spent actually writing code. That's also somewhat depressing. The Space Shuttle Software Program. Many of you have probably heard about this because much computer science literature talks about the Space Shuttle Software Program as one of the best run software projects. And it's probably said to be that because the typical program has about one bug every 100 lines. Uh, Space Shuttle Software has a bug every 30,000 lines. So that's probably why it's considered one of the best. But it's also a really depressing project to work on. I'll take a quote from the person who runs the software project for the Space Shuttle. And his quote includes such gems as, there is a manual for how to do it. And also, uh, the answer is yes, the process does stifle creativity. People have to channel their creativity into improving the process, not into the software. When I hear things like that, I get really depressed. But I also challenge the fundamental premise that the software project for the Space Shuttle was successful. You look at their stats, 42,000, uh, 420,000 KLOCs, right? Uh, 260 engineers, 15 years. If you work all of that out, it comes out to 108 lines per year written per engineer. <laughs> at 1,000 euros a line. So at those costs, whether braces are on their own line, it really matters. You know? <laughs> I mean, you're, you're blowing the cost way off if you put braces on their own lines there. So I challenge the fundamental premise that that software project is even successful. Today, I want to talk about the changes in the way software is being built. And I'd like to talk about the analog of publishing. It used to be that to create a book would take you several good years of work. Right? And then getting the second copy of that book would take a monastery full of monks maybe several weeks to create you the second copy. Distribution was a royal pain. Changes were really hard. These days, you can publish a lot easier because the research tools are there for you to search online. There's spell check and Word. Um, once you publish, you can update things. I think software has undergone that same set of changes. If you look at the tool set that the typical and en engineer uses today, the tool set is much better. Distribution is much better through the app stores and mobile phones. If you look at the success of the apps out there, how many of you have seen this app on the, the big app, Flashlight HD? It's one of the biggest downloads on the iPhone, right? It's not just a flashlight, it's high definition. So when you turn this thing on, it really, like, the white is so white, like, you just wouldn't believe, okay? That's one of the most successful apps in the store. I posit that fundamentally software has changed so that such a thing is even possible today. That you can create an app called Flashlight HD, make a million dollars, and sell one of the top most uh, selling apps in the app store. In a world where software has changed that way, what can you do when the distribution costs are super low, when the cost of changes are also low, when you can't predict the winners, Right? Like, uh, Wik Wikipedia is a great example. If you had pitched that idea to venture capitalists 15 years ago, no one would ever fund it. Like, your pitch would basically be, trust me, I'll open a website with no content, and people will volunteer articles, and then we'll create a great encyclopedia. No one would buy that. I think modern successes can't be predicted. And so in a world where you can't predict the winners, what can you do to optimize your chances? 
One is you have to let a thousand flowers bloom, right? You can't kill ideas too quickly. You have to let them come up grassroots and you have to let them grow. Two is you have to reduce the expense of testing these ideas. You have to be able to release them quickly. And three is you have to treat code as true north. And I think this is a really important point, which is if you have code itself, you know exactly what you can ship and when. If you have a spec that promises the code, you're one level away from the actual code. If you have a PowerPoint presentation that promises the specs, that promises the code, you're two away. And I myself have sat in meetings looking at PowerPoints that promise the specs, that promise the code, right? So the closer to code you actually get, the more true north you are. Many of you are probably familiar with this. This is the classic software project management triangle, right? You have things like cost on one axis, which is the number of people you put on a project. You have time and you have features. And the traditional saying is cheap, fast, good, you can pick two, right? I challenge this fundamental premise because I think software development has changed in a few fundamental ways. One is that cheap is actually fast. Fred Brooks said this 40 years ago in the Mythical Man Month, and we still don't believe it. We still don't embrace it, right? Think about the slowest software project you've ever been on. Now imagine that software project with the bottom half of the people removed from the project, their salaries given to the top half of the people. I guarantee you, you would have shipped that same software a lot faster, right? So cheap is fast. I would say also today, good is also fast. It used to be that we talked about good meaning more features, but you have apps like Flashlight HD demonstrating that actually simple small applications that do their one thing very well, that's actually good. And so good is fast. I'd also posit that fast is also good. The sooner you release, the faster you know whether or not your users will love your product, the more bugs you actually resolve. So I think today, fast is also good. That leads to a new future of software where I think small teams develop frequent releases iterating on their product over time, where cheap is fast, is good, and you no longer trade off between all these things. That's enough on theory. I want to talk a little bit about, at Facebook scale, what do we do to actually try to adhere to these principles, um, to embrace them so that the engineers are as fast as possible. This is a chart that shows the number of commits per month by Facebook engineers. The yellow line is the number of commits. The orange line is the number of engineers over the past seven years. You can see that the number of commits has kept up with the number of en en engineers we've hired, which we're pretty proud of. And I think one of the main reasons for this is we embrace a hacker culture. This sign is in the Facebook headquarters, the hacker company. It's because we very much embrace this idea of hacking as a culture. And I'd like to talk about today what that means for Facebook. So when we talk about the hacker way at Facebook, we talk about four primary things. It's a focus on impact. It's about moving fast. It's about being bold and about being open. I'd like to give a few examples of each of these. If you spend a lot of your time either looking at PowerPoint decks or creating PowerPoint decks, you're probably in the wrong job, right? The closer you get to code, the better you are, the closer you are to shipping something. So at Facebook, when, in, when someone comes up with an idea, the most common response back to them is, that sounds like a great idea, why don't you code it up? It basically gets people to, uh, to basically shut up about the idea and actually write something, right? It makes everything concrete when you say, code the idea up. Hackathons you've probably heard about, 24-hour sessions where engineers work on whatever idea they want. Past hackathon output includes the entire chat feature on Facebook, Facebook video uploads, the like button was a hackathon project, right? Uh, the HPHP compiler timeline was a hackathon project. And so, so many ideas come out of grassroots um, hackathons at Facebook, which is one of the reasons why I love Campus Party. This is my first year here. And it's just amazing, because this, this culture is what I'm talking about, right? The culture that everybody just gets together and builds something. About moving fast, I think there are a few practical things here. One is, when you have a lot of people, you spend a lot of your energy coordinating the movement of those people not to collide, right? People don't get to run on their own. My advice for moving fast, really, is the first thing you want to do on a slow software project is you want to remove people. If your project is slow, you want to remove people and you want to remove process. 
The second thing you want to do is you want to give each team the autonomy to actually make their own decisions, to go their own way. At Facebook, we try to have teams of about two to six people. Once it gets beyond six people, we try to break them up into different teams, have them focus on different things. Because the theory is a team of about two to six can get a whole lot done, can make their own choices. I think size has a lot to do with this, and this is an important point. I don't know where your company is on this. I tried to find German companies, um, Nero, you know, German company. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, huge, right, right. Okay, so size really matters. Like, um, at, yeah, Facebook, you can see Facebook is uh, 1 15th the size of Google. It's 1 26th the size of Microsoft. I think size really matters because size makes it harder and harder to coordinate the actions of people. Um, when I did the Facebook video calling program, which I was responsible for at Facebook, it was a collaboration with Skype uh, before Microsoft bought them. When I did that project, Skype, the company, had more engineers than all of Facebook, than the entire Facebook company, okay? Google's Seattle office, the remote office of Google in Seattle, had more engineers than all of Facebook. And so when you talk about size and coordination, I'm not saying size is a bad thing, I'm just saying size is a difficult thing, right? There's a lot of complexity that has to do with managing largeness. Google is larger than 32 countries in the world. It is literally larger than 32 countries. Microsoft is larger than 42 countries of the world. So the complexity that you're managing at that scale is just super difficult. IBM is 433,000 people. So I couldn't even fit them on this chart because it would make the rest of the chart like unreadable, right, scale-wise. So I think size is difficult. You can certainly run a small company poorly, but I'm saying as you get bigger, this problem gets more and more difficult. We shouldn't underestimate the challenges with coordinating thousands of people. Management theory, you're probably super familiar with this, but there are essentially three ways to control the outcomes you want, right? One way is you choose the right people. You put them on the right projects. Another way is you set the right metrics. You set the right goals, the right, uh, the, the right results. And the last way, you can tell people what to do. It's action control. I really encourage people to focus on choosing the right people, using people control as the primary way to get output. Because once you decide on the right people, you can trust them to take the right actions, right? So you want to hire the right people, put them in the right roles. The right roles are important because every one of us is bad at something, right? So you got to put people on the right roles, and then you can let them go. I think Steve Jobs was pretty famous for repeating the saying that A people hire A people and B people hire C people. So it's super important to hire the A people and to keep them on the right jobs. Results control. You know, you set a few goals, you set some consequences, you set some, you set some targets. This is a great way to get engineers to do the right thing because then you give them the freedom to choose how to meet those results, right? But the important part here is you have to be careful what you measure because of course you get what you measure. The most famous example of this was Mike Daisy at Amazon. He worked three years at Amazon and wrote a book about it. He worked in a call center, and he figured out that his performance reviews were based on the mean time to resolution, meaning the average time it took him to resolve a customer's problem. So how did he get the best reviews? He started hanging up on customers. Hello, this is Amazon, click. <laughs> and of course, his mean time to resolution went super, super low, and he got the best reviews, right? So when you go for results control, you gotta be super careful that you're actually defining the result you really want. In which case, you know, in, in Amazon's case of the call center, mean time to resolution is not the result you actually want. It should be something about long customer satisfaction, right? Action control really should be the last thing you resort to. This is where you tell a person exactly what to do. McDonald's is famous for having a manual this thick of action control. You know, when the fry beeper goes off, you tap the fries, you dump them here, blah, blah, blah. It tells you exactly what to do, when, and how. Action control is great when you know the actions that will lead to the outcomes you want. But the problem in software is oftentimes you don't know the actions you actually want to lead to the outcomes you want, right? The other problem is in software, most of the best ideas come up grassroots from the engineers themselves. Action control leaves no room for that. And this is at the core of my problem with software methodologies. Agile, XP, all this stuff, waterfall, is I think oftentimes non-engineers resort to methodologies to save a failed project. You know what I mean? The project's going a little bit south and like some non-engineer decides Kanban. You know, it's gonna save the day, right? We're gonna go agile on this and it'll make us faster. 
I'm not saying that those processes are wrong. In fact, some of the core ideas are great. Agile's embracement of people over process, I think, is super great. But the problem is, oftentimes, it's action control, right? It's, it's like the last thing you want is to tell people exactly what to do and how. So I think we have to use action control carefully. I'm not saying that process is bad, right? Good people with good process will outperform good people with no process every time. That's absolutely true. You just want to minimize the amount of process and focus really foremost on getting the right people in place, giving them the results that you want them to achieve and letting them make their own choices. The types of people you choose also matter, right? It's not just who you choose, it's the type of person you choose. If you choose a great coder, you will get a lot of great code. If you choose a process person, you will get a lot of process. So I told you that I, I'm responsible for the London office. We recently just opened the office. One of the first resumes that I got was this resume, okay? And I know the words are small, so I'll read you some of the choice tidbits. Um, you know, this person's main responsibilities, ensuring effective communication between Scrum teams and stakeholders, taking active part in Scrum implementation team that was tasked with introducing and overlooking the Scrum process. In fact, it was a committee to overlook the process that overlooked the scrums, right? This sort of resume just really depresses me because this is not engineering, this is, this is a purely process focus. So for myself personally, when I see resumes with ISO numbers on them, when I see resumes with certificate levels, CMMI levels, I just get so depressed because I feel like, oh man, and I haven't even listed all the Microsoft ones, MCSE, MCAD, blah, 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 right? Certified Scrum trainers, DSDM, you know, these sorts of things, my advice is run, don't walk. Like when you see these things on resumes, this is not the type of person that you want. What about being bold? These posters you'll see up all over Facebook's walls, they encourage the employees to be bold. But what is being bold about? This guy, Boz, was my first boss at Facebook. Um, he was instrumental in Newsfeed. He also created Like as a concept, right? Um, this photo was taken on the morning of the IPO where an ad hoc dance competition broke out and Boz was in the dance competition. So Newsfeed I bring up because Newsfeed was a very bold thing when it first went out. In fact, if you talk to longtime Facebook employees, they will say the closest they came to quitting Facebook was when Newsfeed was released because the public backlash was so bad, people hated Newsfeed so much that employees got really disappointed and many people wanted to quit at that time. These days, can you imagine using Facebook without Newsfeed? It, it's like, what, what would you do on there? <laughs> like, there's nothing to do without Newsfeed. But when Newsfeed went out, it was the most hated feature and it was terrible. I think we're going through the same thing with Timeline right now, huge public backlash. There are a bunch of things we need to improve with Timeline. There clearly is a lot more to go. But I think that Facebook has failed many times in the past, and I hope Facebook continues to fail because risk is about the real possibility of failure, right? And without that, you can't move things forward. Let me talk about personal failures and personal boldness. So my second week at Facebook, I was new to PHP. I had never written JavaScript in my life, right? And my second week, I was asked to implement photo tagging on the mobile phone. So if you've ever used photo tagging, you can blame me, right? But I was given that job. I was the only person responsible for it. I pushed it that week, and it went out to 60 million people using it that week. Today, it's still the same code being used. That's an example, I think, of being bold, because if Facebook would let a crazy guy like me do that in his second week coding PHP and JavaScript, right? Like, the whole thing is nuts. So you can still see that feature today. The only final thing that I'll say about being bold is you can't do it on your own. Like, how long is this green cube going to survive, right? You have to be bold in an environment that encourages boldness. Being bold on your own does nothing. Also talking about being open. Um, we try to encourage a lot of fun and freedom at Facebook, um, try to be open to new ideas. One of the ways we do that is whenever an, an engineer has been on a project for 12 months, we encourage him or her to do a hack a month. You take a month off, you hack on a completely different part of Facebook to create and ship a feature that's your idea, okay? And this is to encourage new ideas to actually get shipped out there, to encourage people to change from the projects they work on. We try to be bold in how we decorate things. 
So this is a hot tub in Facebook Seattle um, that I did as part of my space hack. So I bought a used hot tub. I got a graffiti guy to paint the word hack on all four sides. So if you can't tell, that actually says hack. But this hot tub, I moved into the office, and people put cushions in it and, and whatnot, and they actually you know, code in the hot tub. Um, the idea here is that Facebook is really open about even the way we design our space, open to new ideas. And last thing is you can't dictate openness. You know, you have to model the openness. Zuck sits at a desk amongst all the engineers, right? You can walk up to him, ask a question. You have to sort of model the openness that you want in your company. Conversely, signs that you're in trouble. If you spend more time in Microsoft Office products as an engineer, you know, Excel, PowerPoint, Word, less time in Vim, Emacs, you're in trouble. You know, the moment that titles start appearing in people's signatures, you're, you're in trouble, right? There are a lot of signs that things have gone south. So I'd say you look out for these signs. If a non-engineer tells you what code to release when, you're in trouble, okay? The main thing that I want to say is there's three core things to the hacker way. I think one is just how much of your time do you spend actually literally writing code? Are you literally in one of those jobs where 6,200 lines per year is the norm and that's what's expected? Worse yet, are you in a job where 108 lines a year are written? Because that's just terrible, right? Second thing is who is telling you what to write? Are the ideas essentially egalitarian, the way that hackers really want things to be? Or does the highest paid person in the room tell you what to write? And lastly, are, are you taking any real risks? Anybody that tells you that they're taking a calculated risk is not a risk taker. It's just like a pessimist that says, I'm not a pessimist, I'm a realist. They're pessimists, right? So I think real risk taking involves the real risk of actually failing. The video that's playing now is a time lapse video of when we built our new campus. The ideas that I've shared with you today about the hacker culture are so important to Facebook that we actually poured it into the cement of our new campus. The hacker way and all that it entails is the most valuable thing that we've actually built at Facebook and the thing that we're most proud of. And so I'm glad to have had a chance to share some of that with you today. I'd love to take questions right after this, but a few things before we take questions. One is you can always write me, Philip Sue at Facebook, right? Um, you can also go to Campus Party Hack Culture on Facebook, which is the page where I'll post the slides from this. We can have Q&A on, on that and discuss and debate things. Um, and lastly, after the Q&A, I'll ask Kyle, who's standing right behind us there at a desk. He has a bunch of swag, you know, Facebook cups, Facebook bags, Facebook mints, all sorts of random stuff that you're free to get right after the Q&A. Um, and Jackson is also here. Jackson's right there, who you can also ask. He works on the mobile side of Facebook. Anyway, so I'd love to take questions now. Anybody have questions for me? Yes. Thank you. It works? OK. I, uh, just something to your uh, re regarding your presentation. Um, you said, I, I just want to make a statement here. It's not a question. I didn't like the picture of the blonde Tussi and you're commenting you have to get rid of the unneeded personal. I just thought it was inappropriate. But otherwise, yeah, it was good. Thanks. Yeah, and I'd like to address that directly. What I did not mean is that one fires people from the company. What I really mean is that what you want to do is you want to break up teams into small enough sizes that you can actually each work independently on your own. And I totally respect the fact that we are not saying that every one of us should fire half the company. That makes no, no sense at all. We should make sure we only hire people that we truly believe in, that have a place in the company, and we should break up the team small enough that they can each function on their own. Yeah, it's just a visual. Please change it maybe in the next presentation. Okay, great. Good feedback. Thank you.
thank you for interesting presentation. And I would like to ask, how do you pick people? Because you said that you are not interested in the certificates, ISO, right. and this stuff. So how do you pick them? Yeah. Um, I can't answer generally for Facebook. I can only answer for myself. So I'll give you an answer that doesn't scale to the whole company. Um, I love people who demonstrate individual initiative. So when I talk to someone, I always ask them, don't tell me about your work. Tell me about a software project you did on the side. Like, what do you do on, on weekends? What's the latest hack you've done that is not something you got paid for? You know what I mean? Um, really passionate people about technology are always building like new things. You can just ask them, like, what you last build, right? Um, people who get really passionate about that, I, I totally love. I also love people who have a wide variety of interests. So one of the best guys that I talked to in the last two weeks was um, on the side, he was really into building small helicopters. But he actually built all the parts, so he doesn't buy a kit. He actually builds the parts himself. And what's great is you can have a half hour discussion about you know, rotational whatever you know, with this guy. And, and I love the passion. You know? like, passionate people do passionate things, whether in software or anywhere else. And I love to see that passion. So that's the sort of stuff that I look for. So um, you were talking a lot about things not to do, right? Yeah. Like uh, don't get too, uh, too complicated with project management, right. uh, start your own projects. I totally agree with that. But Are very stable, yeah, yeah. so we'll have to do, and you want to ship it to a certain date, so we'll have to do project management. Yeah. Uh, you will have to use some sort of Scrum, Kanban, whatever. Yes. What was your approach to do? What, where do you take away the the complication and the stuff that annoys people, and where do you set your level of this is what we do in project management, this is really what we want, want to do? Yeah, and that's an excellent and deeply profound question, right? Which is the question of. If you are in a software world where dates really matter, what's the right way to manage that, right? And I think so far, Facebook has been lucky enough not to have date-driven software. But this is not the case for many companies, right? SAP, for instance, I'm pretty sure it has date-driven software, right? Certainly Microsoft does. Like when I worked there, right, most projects were date-driven, right? And, and so when you have to manage dates, the only way to hit them reliably, of course, is to put in big buffers and actually manage the crap out of the project itself, which requires a bunch of process. So I do think that depending on the domain of software you're in, that's a huge thing. The other thing about getting real that you mentioned is Timeline's a great example. I was at the hackathon presentation when the first version of Timeline was demoed. In that first version, people got very excited about the idea of Timeline, but the, the implementation was so bad <laughs> that people said, we can't ship this thing. <laughs> like, we have to actually put a team of people on it, designers on it, and actually design this thing so that it actually works. So in that case of getting real, it was acknowledging that, hey, the hacked version embodies a great idea, but we actually need to productize this thing and put like, a real team on it, give them six months to actually build the thing and, and actually make it real. So I am certainly not trying to paint a picture where everybody just does whatever they want and like pushes it onto the site. But I do think that the idea generation phase especially has to encourage the idea that anybody can code anything they want and that nobody tells them not to write the thing they think is going to be really good. Whether you productize it and how you productize it is super tough. And like the space shuttle is a great example where I personally would feel depressed working on that software project. But what was required out of that project is the type of requirement level that most software projects don't have, right? And so I totally respect that when you have those requirements, that, that's what you have to do. It's kind of related to that question. Uh, you said that when you joined Facebook, uh, you got an assignment. And you didn't know PHP, you didn't know JavaScript, and you got assigned to do this photo tagging stuff. Right. And I've, you said it took you a week or two weeks? It took me a week to write that, yeah. yeah. And, and you just pushed it to production. What would, what would have happened if you know, the shit have hit the fans, if right. it would have broken? Right. And the second question is, uh, it's about you know, when hiring new people into a company, into a startup. Uh, what would be your recommended approach into 
having them integrated into your code base and into your products so they could work effectively? Yeah, uh, great both questions. One is Facebook relies a lot on automation to try to save 95% of the things that will go wrong. Like I could not have released the photo tagging feature onto the site without all the automation that backs up the testing of that before releasing it because I was brand new to the code base, right? There was no way for me to understand how the changes I was making might impact other features. The other thing is having the right people code review, of course, makes a huge difference. So although I wrote all the code, people who had been in the mobile space a long time code reviewed the code, gave tons of feedback. I revised the code probably four times before committing the diff. You know what I mean? So I do think that definitely consulting the experts was the bulk of how that feature got done. When it comes to new people and how to, to, to integrate them in, I think that code-wise, many companies take the approach that new people fix bugs. And I think that's a, that's a noble approach. It gives you a broad view of the product. It's mostly things that are self-evidently good to do, right? And I think Facebook certainly also wants people to fix some of the bugs when they join as well. But I think that mixing it in with enough accomplishments that are not just fixing other people's stuff, but actually creating your own, like that balance, I think, is pretty motivational for people. So I think when you sign someone up to a startup or to, or to a big company, it would be great to mix in with the right mentorship on the code base and ability to actually ship something real. You know what I mean? I think there was another question here. So my question is about design. So Facebook has been very aggressive in really focusing design as much as hack as well mm -hmm. as a culture. Um, a lot of designers don't code. They right. like to stick to PSDs and wireframes and sketches. Right. So are a lot of the design concepts within Facebook, are they, do they go straight to code? Or where do the designer, I guess, where do they fit in the culture? Yeah, great question. Um, there's about a designer every 10 engineers at Facebook. There's about a product manager every 10 engineers. So that gives you a sense of like design plays a huge role at Facebook compared to most companies, right? Um, the designer I worked with in the past year, so the feature that was just announced yesterday with the rewrite of the messages, you know, on, uh, that was my, my team, so I'm glad to be able to talk about it. The designer on that team, Kun Ba, came from Sofa. He actually writes code. <laughs> and that, frankly, is a little bit scary because he's always given me, like, have you tried this JS framework, blah, 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 and he's, like, pushing stuff to me. Um, but I love it. Um, most designers at Facebook don't write code. The things we've been trying to do there are on a few fronts. One is really have design sitting with the engineers actually doing the work. So Kuhn, when doing the messages, sat right in the middle of all the engineers committing code. He was signed into all the code reviews. So he himself could like keep a pulse on like what's going on, right? So I think that's a huge part of it. I think another part of it is Facebook is putting a lot of efforts into building tooling that allows designers to commit changes without knowing how to code. So a common complaint of designers in most web companies, right, is like they give you like a version of CSS that like kind of shows what you want and then the, en the engineer essentially retypes it in the right way, in the right, factors it in the right, right? Like that's a common problem. So how Facebook is trying to tackle that problem right now is building a tool chain that allows designers to directly mess with that and commit it, you know what I mean? So, uh, so getting people more involved without the actual skills that it takes to commit the code is, I think, going to be a key part of it. But I think the biggest thing is just making sure they sit together. Just in reference to the designer being able to push the code project, like Fabricator is a great open source yeah. package for development. Are, are, do you sort of foresee that a lot of these designer-centric tools will start to become open source or in the community? I'm certainly hoping so. Like okay. almost most of the projects that Facebook builds, if at all possible, we want to make open, right? Because the whole point is the community building on top of the tool will just help us move a lot faster. So absolutely, if there's any set of tools that we can build, um, those sort of meta things should all be open. Other questions for me? Great, well thank you for your time. Jackson's back there, you can chat with him, and there's a lot of swag that Kyle is giving away. He's waving back there, so do feel free to pick up the Facebook cups and mints and whatnot, and I will be hanging about here afterwards, so feel free to come up to me. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Warm applause, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.